Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature, Wild Asian Elephants and Their Captive Counterparts, presented by Surya Ramachandran. Surya has been guiding for Nahab in India since 2017, and today he's joining us very late at night from his home in India. Thanks for being with us today, Surya. I'll hand things over to you. Thank you so much, Kendall. Hello, everyone. Uh, just before I start, I'd like to say I'm going to turn off my uh, camera to save some bandwidth. And I'll be back on the screen at the end of the talk. And here we go. I hope I'm loud and clear for everyone. Kendall, can you just confirm that? Yes, I can hear you great. Thank you. Sure thing. So yes, uh, wild Asian elephants and their captive counterparts. Um, this is a topic that has been very close to my heart, especially over the last two years, because I have moved to an elephant reserve in South India, and that's where I live. And I have been part of a, a few surveys of the conditions in which elephants are kept in captivity in India for various purposes. And it has been a very emotional experience for me for over the last two years. And I have been, I, I must be honest and say I am a little opinionated on the topic. Uh, but I'll try to be diplomatic and I'll try to be uh, try to cover it in the most intellectual way possible without involving too much of emotion into it. So here we go. Um, that's me. Uh, for those of you who couldn't see the screen. And yes, uh, this is what I do. I'm a wildlife guide with NATHAB in the South Asian region. And I lead their tiger trips and their snow leopard trips and uh, various other trips in the region. And here I am going to be talking to you about Asian elephants. I mean, uh, I'm not sure how much Asian elephants are spoken about uh, generally because of the uh, dominance of African wilderness tourism. Uh, but here we go. Let's see how much we can cover today in the time given to me. So you have three maps in your screen now, and there's my cursor. So this is the global range of elephants right here, the red being the South Asian region and the green being the African region. And in the South Asian region, you can see the brown patches here where the elephants are actually distributed. Like you can see a lot of them in India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, uh, Malaysia, Borneo, Sumatra, Java, parts of Vietnam, Thailand. And yes, so this is where the Asian elephants are found. And just within India, you can see that the elephants are found all along the Himalayan foothills, which is the northeast. This is the Himalayas going along the northern border of India. And the uh, Himalayan foothills is a very good spot for the elephants because it's a lush, uh, moist jungle over there. Similarly, eastern India and southern India, where I'm from. In fact, I'm from right here, this small pocket of blue over here. That's where I'm living right now. And that's where I'm talking to you, all of you from right now. So this is the elephant belt of India. And uh, before we jump into Asian elephants, uh, just uh, I thought I should introduce the different kinds of elephants in the world. Of course, you have the two kinds in Africa. All of these, uh, not all of these, the two in Africa are subspecies and the various ones in Asia are subspecies. So basically there are two kinds of elephants in the world, the African elephant and the Asian elephant. And if this is too hard to remember, some of you can look at this and maybe that's a easier, more fun way to remember how the elephants actually are uh, separated world over. I mean, I, I always find that quite funny. The cartoons here are done by a very good friend of mine. He's from Green Humor. And you should go check his website out whenever you can. And his content is quite fantastic. So before we jump into the natural history or even the conservation status or the biology of Asian elephants, um, I wanted to introduce all of you to a little bit about how to separate an Asian and African elephant. I mean, in these images, it looks quite obvious, but there are certain features that you need to look at to be 100% sure that you're talking about an Asian or an African elephant. The first thing that I look at always is the shape of the ears. Uh, and a very easy way to remember this is that the African elephant has in a year the shape of, of the African continent while the Asian elephant has a smaller ear, which is which more or less looks like the Indian Peninsula. Uh, that is the first thing that I look at. Uh, but apart from that, there there is one very interesting feature, which is the tip of the trunk. Well, where where the Asian elephant has one finger or one lobe of a lip sticking out from its trunk for grasping, while the African elephant has 
two, one above and one below. There are various other differences like the number of toes in their hind legs, the highest part of their body, uh, the overall shape. And yes, definitely the African elephant gets a lot bigger. They get, a, get to about 6 to 6.5 tons, whereas the Asian elephant uh, gets to about 5 tons or 5.5 tons maximum. The other differences I'll, I'll talk about as we go through the slides. So this is a herd of Asian elephants. And the first thing you will notice when you see this is that this is a herd of females. How do you, how do you say that? A herd of females is very simple because the females in Asian elephants do not have tusks. And this over here is a young male. So most of the herds in Asian elephants are matriarchal. They are run by a, matri a dominant female who has other females and young ones in her herd. Whereas the males lead a solitary life, usually by themselves or at the fringes of the herd. So Asian elephants, quick thing to remember, no tusks in the females, whereas African elephant females do have tusks. So here we, talk, we are talking about the males. Uh, the males, obviously, the first striking feature is the, is the beautiful large tusks that they have. But another important feature to note about the males is the shape of their forehead. They have a very pronounced forehead, especially in Asian elephants, especially the large males. They have a very distinct two-lobed forehead, whereas in the African elephants, the forehead is a single uh, uh, protrusion. Whereas in the Asian elephants, it's clearly demarked as two separate protrusions. And of course, the tusks are visible in the males. And the tusks can get quite big. I mean, uh, this is uh, one very special elephant which lives very close to my house. And his tusks cross over and they touch the ground. I mean, when I look at tusks like this, I think it's beautiful. But sometimes I end up questioning the functionality of such large, large tusks. I mean, it has to be a huge hindrance for this elephant. So uh, tusks like these look great, but I'm not sure how exactly they help the elephant when their tusks are so big. Uh, it definitely looks like something that gets in the way of a lot of things. But there is another kind of male Asian elephant. These are the tuskless males, and they're locally known as maknas. And I think the English term for it is a hind, H-I-N-E. And these elephants, definitely you can say by the large forehead protrusion again, which I mentioned earlier, and of course the larger size. So you can definitely not confuse them with the females if you look at the foreheads properly and overall dimension of the elephant. But yes, these elephants do not have tusks. So here you can see two males in combat. And one is a tusker and the other is a tuskless male or a makna, which I mentioned earlier. So there has actually been, studies have shown that there is actually no advantage or disadvantage of uh, at least in terms of how they project themselves as a dominant male in front of the females, uh, whether they have tusks or not. But tusks definitely are an, are an advantage when you're talking about feeding behavior of elephants because they come in handy when elephants want to scrape the bark off or break a branch of a tree and tusks do come in handy. In fact, there is a very interesting feature about tusks of elephants that it is very similar to our hands. Like some of us are right-handed, some of us are left-handed. Similarly, elephants do prefer to use one particular tusk over the other. And generally the best way to say it is by looking at uh, the tusk and saying which one is more worn or which one is more damaged than the other. And that is a very easy way of saying, <coughs> excuse me, a very easy way of saying whether the elephant is left tusk or right tusk. So elephants, uh, I'm not sure how many of you have seen or familiar with Asian elephants, but at a couple of times in the year, the male starts secreting a particular uh, liquidy secretion from uh, a gland behind their eyes. And this is the time when one has to be wary of approaching a wild elephant or even a domestic elephant for that matter. Because these males are in a, in a state of must is, as it is known locally. Or it is, in my, in, I would put it as a state of being erotically charged. Where they are in the need to mate, they are in the need to uh, fight with other males. And they are in the mood where uh, everything is directed towards dominance. At a time like this, even the most docile uh, or well understood uh, individual elephant can become really unpredictable. So this is the time of must 
which is shown by Asian elephant males. You can see in this picture, these two males are actually secreting, you can't see it in this one, but this one you can actually see that behind the eye, there is a liquidy secretion which is coming out and they bore and they both of them are sizing each other up and going in for a conflict. And this is in the uh, tropical jungles of in the Himalayan foothills. So we've kind of got around to understanding how an Asian elephant male looks and how a female looks and how a tuskless male looks. Uh, let's get into the natural history of elephants and what they do actually in the Indian wilderness. Uh, I'm going to be talking a lot more about the Asian elephants in India because that is something I'm more familiar with than the populations in Nepal or Vietnam or Burma or even Sri Lanka for that matter. So definitely throughout the population of Asian elephants in the country, they are all pretty much migratory, especially the herds. The herds tend to migrate between the seasons to different parts. Uh, there could be small migrations in the Himalayan foothills. There would be uh, migrations in South India. There will be migrations in Eastern India. And these follow a set pattern generally based on food availability and their necessity to give birth in particular places. When I say necessity to give birth in particular places, I have personally observed elephants coming to a particular valley in the mountain range where I live, where they give birth. And they come there year after year to give birth. And then they move out depending on the rains, depending on the availability of seasonal fruit, depending on the availability of grazing grounds. They go over the mountains, they go down to the plains and again climb back up. In fact, in the summer months, uh, we have noticed something very interesting where almost 1,500 to 2,000 elephants congregate in the reservoirs of some rivers in South India. And why they do that, and they have been doing that uh, according to documented records over 500 years and these elephants have been congregating you can see a part of it here in this backwater of a reservoir and they come there because of the fresh grass and they congregate there year after year communicate with each other and then disperse off in different directions and that is one of the interesting spectacles to observe with with regards to elephants in south india so when i say most of the elephants are migratory i mean most of them are migratory because some of them choose to stay back. And that I feel is an adaptation based on uh, the based on maybe their ability to not migrate or their comfort zone in a particular place. So this particular individual, uh, he uh, lives in a town very close to me. And he has been living here for the last 15 years and he has never left. In fact, he is so comfortable in the town. He's so, so comfortable about, amongst people that he just hangs around all the time in the streets, in the banana plantations, in the tea gardens. And in this picture, it's a very special picture, which I really like, where he is in the ticket counter of the national park. And all of us were waiting to buy the tickets to enter the park. And he had just blocked the entrance. And we all had to wait for him to leave before we can go in and see wildlife. And that's uh, something interesting. So there are a couple of individuals like this in different parts of India who have become comfortable with their surroundings despite the, adver the adversities or it could even be an urban situation but they have become comfortable and they live in these uh, surroundings for much longer periods as compared to the traditional migratory herds so why they migrate i mean uh, let's talk a little bit about the reasons for migration like i said one is the food availability the weather and the uh, uh, and the need to give birth in a particular place but most of all, it is definitely the food availability. The food availability is something which drives the elephants uh, to different parts in different times of the year. For an animal of that size, which needs to consume at least half of its body weight on a daily basis. So they pretty much just eat and sleep and that's all they do. And between uh, when they're not doing that, they walk to different areas. And that's pretty much what the elephants do through the year. And where they go, what they do, I'll try to explain uh, without getting into the geology of the landscape too, too much because for a person who's not been to India, it could be a little hard to understand. So definitely grazing is something they really seek out, fresh grass. For example, this elephant here, this Tosca, he has come out into the meadow at the edge of the forest and he is scraping the ground with his toes. You can see that the grass here is scraped off and he collects the grass into small lumps with using his toes and using his forefeet 
and then you, he uses his trunk to scoop them up and feed on them. And this sometimes they do for hours together because it is rich grass, very nutritious, but they need large quantities of it to supplement their diet. In fact, so if anyone have ever told you an elephant is a sloppy animal in the jungle, please don't believe them because these elephants have come to this grassy cliff because of the recent rains and they have gone on to this steep precipice and they have watched, they've come there because of the fresh rains and which has got out the grass. And they were up there for a day entirely and then they went back down this way. And I saw this myself and it is quite a sight and it takes the level of respect that one has for an elephant to a different level. It is quite a sight to see these otherwise what people think to be a sloppy animal navigating these extremely steep cliffs just to get out to get onto the fresh nutritious growth that is coming out of the mountainside of course uh, for an elephant which is uh, seeking uh, rich nutritious food it definitely goes after seasonal fruit so jackfruit uh, like you can see the elephants feeding on these large green fruit which is the jackfruit they go after those and they use their tusks quite often to bring them down from the trees. Uh, there are many such fruits that the elephant go for in different times of the year. So the migration is also triggered by fruiting seasons in different parts of the forest. And they often do come to salt licks because uh, you can see a young tusker here uh, scraping the mud off the ground to get to the salts. And how they do it is they blow their uh, uh, blow a gust of air from their trunks get the mud out of the way and get to the salt and suck them in. And that is uh, something which I've noticed quite often, irrespective of the time of the year, simply because when they consume so much green and their digestive tracts are not really well designed to process all that food. So they need the excel, excess salts <clears throat> to aid with their digestive processes. And one other thing they do, which is, uh, which they do unfortunately quite often is debark the trees because they uh, try to get to the heartwood of the tree, some of which is quite nutritious for the elephants. And sometimes they actually feed on the bark of the tree because sometimes it's loaded with calcium, which they need at different times of the year, depending on their diet. And depending on the size of the tree, it can even kill the tree quite often. So it is a, an interesting uh, thing where you might actually, if a herd of elephants stays in a patch of forest, and starts feeding on the, on the bark, they can quite surely uh, empty the forest of all the healthy trees in that region. So in a way, it is good that they're migratory. So uh, I think nature has designed it perfectly that they feed, feed off a particular area and then move on to different places. So it's all quite well designed, despite the fact that it may look horrible to see a clean shaven forest um, just because of a herd of elephants. And most importantly, through the year, they feed heavily on bamboo. <clears throat> so here you see this tusker. His name is Thump. And he comes to my backyard quite regularly. And he is very surely right tusk. You can see him using his tusk to bring down this huge bamboo. Uh, and then he breaks it up, feeds on the tender shoots and also on the leaves. So bamboo is something elephants are heavily associated with in Asia. So any forest with, where there is tall bamboo growth, there will be elephants and they do feed on the bamboo through the year, despite the availability of other kinds of food. But unfortunately or fortunately, uh, through the years, there has been a lot of uh, agricultural act activity in elephant country. And there has also been a lot of modification of uh, natural elephant habitat in terms of weeds being grown in terms of invasive plants taking over their grazing grounds. So a lot of elephants in recent years have started raiding these agricultural fields at the edge of the forest, like this one here. And this has been an interesting new development, also partially because of the change in the way people grow their crops. People are now more interested in growing cash crops like sugarcane, which is like a magnet for the elephants. So they come out of the forest and they raid the crops and if a herd of elephants gets into the field at night, one can be pretty sure that their crop for the season is definitely over. And one interesting thing we observed uh, when we were watching these crop raiding elephants, especially a friend of mine who was studying this particular herd of elephants, he noticed that 
these young males were forming bachelor herds and teaming up when they were crop raiding. Otherwise, when they were in the forest, they were by themselves. But when they come out to raid crops, they form these gangs of males who used to work really well together. Some of them would distract the farmers. Some of them would come out from the back and raid the crops. And all of this happens at night. And then they disappear back to the forest and it looks like they are now individual separate males again. And this behavior is something really recent observed as early as uh, probably just three years ago. And this is now happening year after year with a particular set of elephants in South India. And it's quite fascinating to think that they've learned quite fast that if you come into the fields as individual elephants, you might have not have as good a chance as as instead of you give away your instincts and team up with a bunch of males who are hanging around in the area and get into the fields together and that's been working quite well for them unfortunately not too well for the farmers so you can imagine a large animal migrating through a vast landscape and feeding on a large amount of food and you're going to have a lot of conflict and that is what is happening in a country like India, especially India, because it is a heavily populous country with a lot of development happening and a lot of encroachment into forest land and traditional elephant migratory routes. So in this country, uh, over the last 20 years, we have seen a lot of conflict in areas where there was no conflict in the past. Uh, this is a really interesting picture where this sugarcane load has been stopped by this elephant and he has figured out the best way to get to the sugarcane without raiding the fields is to raid the transport trucks. So elephants are intel intelligent animals and they adapt really well to uh, the changes brought in by man, but their adaptations may not always go down well with the rest of the human population who live around them. So, so when a large herd of elephants migrate, and when I say migrate, I'm talking about migrating hundreds to even thousands of kilometers every year. So all of you are familiar with the migration in Kenya where people, uh, where wildebeest and zebra migrate from the Serengeti to the Mara, chasing the rains and fresh grass and they come back. And all of that looks great. But in a country like India, when an animal chooses to migrate, there is a whole lot of hurdles to be crossed. They could be railway tracks, roads, farms, fields, electrical fences, even big cities, as you can see in this picture. So migration is not such a, a poetic topic in our country. It is actually a topic which involves a lot of debate and a lot of conservation thought process goes into it year after year. And scenes like this, I'm sorry to use such a graphic image, but scenes like this are not rare. Uh, there is a lot of conflict in our country when it comes to elephant herds, raiding fields in large numbers, and the people do not take well to it after a point because from the farmer's point of view you have to realize a herd of elephants get into his fields his livelihood for the year is over so there is a very complicated situation with regards to elephant conservation in the indian scenario and the solution to this at least uh, what the Dep forest department and some of the people have agreed on is capturing of these elephants so this is something which I'm still on the fence on, but I'm going to tell you the story as it is. So how they capture elephants is a multitude of ways. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have trained veterinarians who dart the elephants to the right number, as you see in Africa and other parts of the world. Here, what we do is we use domestic elephants who are known as kumki elephants, K-U-M-K-I, kumki elephants, who are taken into the wild to capture these rogue elephants, rope them down, and then they are carried like this to uh, an elephant camp or a forest department area where they are kept and they will never be released back into the wild. What this does is, uh, in a way, when a group of farmers see the authorities capturing the elephant that has been causing them harm, they feel relieved immediately. It looks like there's a visual relief for them. And it is this visual relief that kind of abates the tension with regards to wild elephants. But is it good overall? Is it good way to, uh, is it a good solution for the problem? I'm not too sure. One other way of capturing elephants, which is which was followed in India for many years, were these false pits, which were covered with uh, leaves and uh, wood, which the elephants walk over and they fall into the pit and then they're captured from there. So this process 
of capturing elephants goes hundreds of years ago in India because elephants were heavily used in the timber industry, in the shipbuilding industry, and also in the warfare. So elephants were a big part of South Asian armies. In fact, the number of elephants used was a big, uh, 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 was like a big way to tell whether the armies were big and strong or not. Um, and elephants were captured uh, a lot uh, in huge numbers for this practice. And, and even then, there were multiple ways of capturing elephants. As you can see, they were using trained elephants to capture wild elephants. They were using rope traps. But one interesting method that was used to capture elephants was herding the elephants into huge enclosures where there were a lot of trees. And these uh, brave men would jump down from the trees and tie the elephant's foot to the base of the tree. In fact, they would jump down to and hide amongst the feet of the elephants and tie the rope to the tree nearby. And then once these elephants are tied to the trees, they will come and break them down in individually and train them to be domestic elephants. And that is how it was all, all through the past. And now we are talking about elephants being captured by the use of domestic elephants in small numbers where there is conflict involved. And I must reiterate and say that I'm not sure this is a good solution, but I'm just giving you the story as it is. So what happens once the elephant is captured? So there is two different scenarios here. Either you capture a, a, an adult wild elephant or you capture a baby elephant. And the situation in both these cases is very different. Here you see a, a problem tusker, a problem tusker because he was raiding crop fields and he is captured and he is put in these uh, wooden cages for sometimes months together till he decides to give in and listen to his tiny masters. And it's as cruel as it sounds. Uh, this is the only way to uh, make the elephant listen to, uh, uh, maybe I would put it this way, this is the only way to make a four ton animal listen to a 60 kilogram human being is by making sure that it thinks that it has no way around it. And these uh, wooden contraptions are called uh, kraals, K-R-A-L-L, -L, and these kraals, are where the adult elephants are kept till they are weak and tired and they just give in to anyone who gives them food and they start listening. And it's pretty horrible to witness. Uh, though people say it's a necessity to break the elephant and make sure it starts listening to the mahouts, I'm not too sure it's a good practice. On the other hand, uh, this is an image that a lot of you must have seen. A young elephant is like a young kid, full of energy, full of life, always jumping around, always trumpeting always curious so an elephant like that needs to be obedient and it needs to be quiet and you must understand that an elephant once it is like three years old is big enough to hurt a human being even playfully so that is not something that the handlers of the elephant will want so they will try to subdue the elephant at an earlier stage and that may involve a lot of tying up a lot of beating and different practices are there in different parts of the country but overall, it is required that the elephant be tamed at an earlier stage so that he is not a liability to the handlers who are working with them. So once these elephants are uh, trained and subdued and, uh, and started listening uh, to, the, uh, to their handlers, then there is multiple scenarios. So elephants are owned by two sets of people in our country. One is, of course, the private enterprise, which uses them for, let's say, elephant rides, or timber work, as you can see in this image. But there's another set which uses elephants for uh, just for rehabilitation purpose, which is usually the forest department and the government, where in some centers, they are very well taken care of, very well fed, and they have open areas to roam around. So it is not always a gloomy picture that I wish to paint, but there is both sides to the story that people need to be aware of. So these elephants are often used for patrolling in the forest or for research purposes or uh, to track wild animals, which can't be done on foot. Because like we saw in the earlier picture, the elephant is the best all-terrain vehicle in the jungle. And an elephant with the mahout is a very important tool, even today in the Indian jungle, to uh, patrol the forest and make sure it is well protected. Because unlike the African uh, plains, the Indian jungle is more hilly, more dense. So it is not always possible for a person to go on foot or uh, even in a Jeep. Uh, and they'll need to use these elephants quite often to get the job done. So there is a lot of elephants in these forest camps 
who live amongst the forest in a controlled environment, but overall their lives are far better than the ones which are still used in the industries. So like I said, elephants in captivity are used heavily for in the logging industry. Uh, they, were, they were first captured for the logging purpose and then the armies. And even today in some parts, they are used heavily to transport wood from one part of the jungle to the other. And of course, uh, the infamous part of uh, domestic elephants usage was in the 18th and 19th century, early 19th century, when uh, elephants were used heavily by the Maharajas and their guests to go into the forest and shoot wildlife because they had the safety of the elephant back to insulate them from the dangers of the animals and the elephants could get them quite close. In fact, uh, some of their practices were quite, I would say, lazy in, in a way. I mean, that's how our Maharajas were. They were mostly lazy. And uh, they used to use other elephants to surround the animal. And then they would go on another elephant and shoot it at point blank range. And that is how most of our beautiful wildlife was wiped out because of such badly thought out hunting practices. And now in some parts, like I mentioned, every elephants are heavily used for uh, patrolling the jungle to monitor wildlife, to keep an eye on the borders of the jungle, on the habitat quality. So there are elephants in, in use even today by the forest department <clears throat> and the wildlife department to, uh, to uh, let's say, keep an eye on the wildlife and uh, contribute to the conservation process. And also, these elephants are also used at, uh, during the wildlife season time for elephant safaris. This is again a topic which uh, people uh, have different opinions on. Is it necessary to ride an elephant to go see wildlife? Is it necessary to uh, get another wild animal to go see another wild animal? So there's a lot of ethical debates with regard to elephant safaris. But I must say that I'm not sure what side to take on this one. But I'm pretty sure that I'm not okay with this. Country for entertainment. So we have had our ban on circuses, which is a big thing. But elephants are still used in uh, private land to entertain people for photo shoots, to pose with them, to give them a bath. Sometimes elephants like this could be forced to stay in water for maybe even uh, 12 to 15 hours a day to make sure they are constantly uh, providing photo opportunities for the tourists. And things like this, I have definitely not been okay with. On the other topics, I may be on the fence because there could be a need beyond uh, what we see. But with things like this, I'm not too sure it is necessary in today's day and age. And one other practice that is being followed in some parts of the country are, uh, I'm not sure how many of you have been to India before, but the hottest part of India is a state called Rajasthan, where there are no wild elephants. It's a desert of the country. And in this uh, uh, state of Rajasthan, there is a city called Jaipur, where there are 102 elephants kept in 50 degrees Celsius in the dry heat in the open. And they are used by people to provide rides of, uh, for the tourists from the bottom of the fort on hot concrete slabs till the top through the day. And practices like this are what our domestic elephants are going through in some parts of the country. And I want you to understand this because we have been talking a little bit about wild elephants. And from the first slide to now, you can see the stark contrast which the same animal in the same country is going through. And there is the Indian perspective to the whole thing. So this is the elephant god or Ganesh who is one of our most important gods. Uh, all of you must know in Hinduism, we have over a thousand different gods and Ganesh or the elephant face god is one of the most important ones. So the elephant is heavily revered in our country as a very sacred holy animal. And what has that uh, done to the elephant? The elephant is now omnipresent in most of our temples, standing in the same spot, blessing people for a little bit of money on a daily basis. And I'm not sure what led to this manifestation, but people still believe, especially most of India still believes that uh, a blessing from an elephant is a big deal for them. It is something very important when they go to a temple to be blessed by an elephant. So an elephant like this, so this is an elephant in a temple in South India in a place called Pondicherry. 
and he stands there through the year uh, especially in the mornings and evenings where and that's his mahout over there and these two have been together for the last 25 years and here i'd like to say that the mahout and the elephant bond for life and a mahout works with one elephant and the elephant listens to only mahout one mahout usually and these two uh, have been sitting in this temple on the same porch maybe for the last 20 years as long as i know and i have seen this elephant grow up in this porch and when i was young i used to enjoy, enjoy watching it but over time i realized the truth behind this and what the elephant is actually going through especially when you see wild elephants and you see this it doesn't feel too good and this is how the holiness of the asian elephant is has manifested itself in certain parts of the country and if you think this was bad you should see this so this is the annual temple festival in one part of south india and these majestic large tuskers are hand picked by the temples to join the parade and over here you can be sure that there are around 20000 people surrounding these elephants and the chaos that's going in on in their mind is not something even i can imagine after seeing this uh, for a couple of times and year after year there are incidents here where the elephants run uh, amok amongst the people they just lose control and they end up trampling a few people and i feel that is the most natural reaction that a wild animal can have when put in a situation like this and here you can see the people are actually worshiping this elephant and unfortunately what what they think they are doing is respecting the animal but they are forgetting that the animal has a totally different thought process in its head and this is one of the realities of uh, the problem of elephants in our country because as soon as you ta start uh, talking about elephant conservation in india the first thing that people will point to is if a temple can do it legally in the open why can't i do it and then you, will you take on a whole uh, religious community in a country especially hindus in a country like india which is more the majority of the population so when questions like that arise uh, we are not really sure how this can go forward how the concept of elephant uh, conservation can even move forward without addressing these legitimate uh, elephant uh, shows uh, in the in in like the most prominent open spots in our country these are not even done in the or secretly this is a legal thing that happens year after year and to give you another reality check these elephants which are so revered so important to the temple are kept in such conditions uh, through the year uh, during the other times of the year they kept in open areas by the beach in a small plot under the hot sun tied down sometimes hands and legs tied and stretched outside and these are the same elephants which are worshiped on different times of the year and i was uh, unfortunately or fortunately part of a survey which went and reviewed uh, areas like this and i felt this particular place this temple courtyard for their most revered hand picked tusked elephants is uh, an elephant hell if i may say it uh and i don't wish to put it in any other way it was quite shocking to see that these elephants which are so important for the people emotionally socially and also his, uh, traditionally are kept in such horrible conditions so there are about 48 elephants in this small plot and they are taken out to bless people at different times of the year and they are also taken out for the parades as you saw earlier in the images so yes the elephant conservation in india is multi layered it is extremely complicated and this on the other hand is a wild elephant in india so after seeing the last few slides and you see a slide like this this is what it is meant to be this is what it is to worship and to protect a wild animal which is holy which is considered holy by the people of the country and not what you saw in the earlier slides and i'd like to also take you to a different place to talk about a very interesting unique problem um this picture i'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this is rajan a very popular elephant in the andaman islands which is off the east coast of india and he was very popular among photographers because he used to cross small channels of the sea by swimming across it and how beautiful it may sound this elephant was put through torture to swim through salt water which they naturally not favoring and he did this year after especially for photographers to get the right shot so 
in this island complex which i'd like to show you here so this is the mainland india and this is where i live just south of this town called mysuru i live here in this hill range over here and these are the andaman islands and in the andaman islands we do not have wild elephants but there is a lot of forest in the andaman islands excuse me so what happened was there were a lot of elephants which were shipped shipped there many years ago for the timber industry that was flourishing there so they were there to transport wood to the beaches to the ships and to the harbors from the forest so there were many elephants there but now that practice has been stopped in these islands and what has happened is we now have around 80 to 85 feral elephants in a, in a few islands in the andamans and people don't know what to do with them and unfortunately what these elephants are doing is they're trying to survive and what what does it mean when an elephant tries to survive he destroys the forest he or she empties out large swaths of forest to open up meadows for their grazing and in a very fragile island ecosystem like the andamans this is uh, extremely bad for the native wildlife the native flora the native uh, fauna and these elephants are running crazy in these islands and the closest elephant habitat where they can be relocated is here so how do you manage a herd of elephants in a remote island in the andamans in a beautiful wildlife sanctuary which is full of native flora and fauna and these elephants have now become a problem they are actually damaging the native wildlife of the area and what do you do with them it is impossible to ship 85 elephants from this island capture them and shift them to the mainland of the country it is impossible it is not right to let them be and continue doing what they're doing because they will finish off the native fauna of those islands which is not acceptable either and we unfortunately in india culling is not an option killing elephants uh, even in such a situation is not an option because they are holy so the whole situation of elephants and elephant conservation and wild elephants or captive elephants whatever the situation may be in india or even the whole of south asia for that matter in, in fact even in sri lanka i'm not sure how many of you have been there elephants are heavily used in the buddhist ceremonies and even the most popular tooth relic temple in the city of kandy has over 100 elephants and these elephants are sent to different functions throughout sri lanka for the religious festivals to provide the blessings necessary so it is not only uh, uh, restricted to hinduism or india this practice is quite heavily uh, uh, prevalent in sri lanka in thailand in vietnam in nepal in burma so it is quite common across uh, south asia unfortunately and throughout the region the elephant conservation idea or the concept of elephant conservation is still a question which is waiting for an answer so i want to uh, show you guys uh, show all of you this particular comic done by the same friend of mine uh, from green humor and then i think this uh, strip puts uh, the situation of elephants in south asia very simply and very clearly and you can see that the elephant in india is chained in temples and zoos has its habitat destroyed for dams roads and mines is run over by trains poached for ivory is forced to beg on the roads for money along with its mahout whipped in circuses and worshipped as the elephant god and unfortunately the elephants feel in this trip that the only way to go forward is to pretend to be the god itself and not to be a wild elephant so this is the reality of elephant conservation in india and me i've been lucky to work with both wild and captive elephants in the recent years and i still don't have a solution i'm just raising a lot of questions and a lot of things for everyone who's listening to this to think about but to be honest i still don't have a solution or none of us in india still have a concrete solution to this problem thank you so much for listening thank you again for natap to for letting me speak about a topic which is very close to my heart thank you everyone thank you thank you so much surya um we will get to questions now and there are a lot of questions um, if you do have a question for Surya, you can uh, post that in the questions field in your control panel. And I will get to as many as I can, can you hear me? Uh, by the top of the hour. Yeah, Surya, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, great. Um, uh, first, first question for you. Um, how is the current wild population in India? Is it growing or declining? How are they doing? 
well uh, the population in india uh, at least uh, as of the last 20 years is definitely growing and i'm not sure it's a good thing so right now the population is around uh, 28000 wild elephants and i think the, by the previous survey the estimate was around 26000 so it sounds great but to be honest do we have the space for more elephants after whatever i have told you uh, because our human population is also growing and do we actually have the space for more wild elephants and that is a big question which we need to ask ourselves but yes to answer the question yes the population is stable and growing by a small amount okay um and does the government reimburse farmers for damage caused by elephants yes to an extent but it is definitely not uh comparable to what they would make if they actually sell their crops successfully so you have to realize uh, a farmer who has a couple of acres of land um, may lose all his crop to elephants if the elephants decide to target his field for a few days and that crop would be worth quite a lot of money and when a government is compensating the farmer for a, f a, f a couple of farmers in a community then it may not be possible to give the same amount of money to each farmer or the money that they deserve so there is definitely uh, an emotional damage also to the farmer, but yes, there is a huge financial damage despite the compensation. But in some areas, there are some other parties, there are NGOs, there are some conservationists who are supplementing the compensation. And they're also teaching farmers how to live amongst elephants, what crops to plant, how to uh, basically let them uh, uh pass through their fields without damaging too much or how to handle an elephant which has come into their farms so basically uh, to put it simply when an elephant comes into your field and you decide to burst crackers to scare it away or decide to start a fire or shout and scream what happens is in their panic they may even cause more damage than if they just quietly feed a little bit and slip away so things like this are still being uh, taught to the farmers there's a lot of education involved but to answer the question in one line financially, yes, they are comp compensated, but it is definitely not always possible to give the right amount. Okay, great. And um, there's a question about uh, using alternative methods, about teaching the farmers to use things like unappealing scents or beehives like they do in Africa. Is that happening? Yes, that is happening a lot. Uh, in fact, uh, beehives have come in huge. In fact, we have chili fences. Have you heard of that? Uh, we have something called chili fences where the farmers lace their fences with chili and that seems to keep the elephants away. So there are a lot of experimental processes that are happening in different parts of the country to keep elephants at bay. Uh, some of them tried solar fencing and the elephants realized that if they throw a, 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 throw a branch of a tree onto the fence, the, the fence gets short circuited and they're able to cross over after that. So the elephants are also smart there is a lot happening um, and the elephants are also popping up in new areas where there were no elephants before because of the changes in their migratory routes so all of this is still uh, uh, a thing that is causing for uh, giving reason for constant change in thought process and constant change in the adaptations both on the human part and on the elephant's part so and also you have to realize that the indian farmer is not similar to a european farmer or maybe even an american farmer an indian farmer is generally very a very poor man uh, he lives uh, basically on a daily basis on every uh, crop he puts in he needs to succeed for him to take care of his family and even have a little bit left for him or her so in such a situation when you're trying to put in additional expenses on his plate to just to keep his farm safe uh, it may not always be possible hmm okay um is, is there any movement in india to create or enforce standards for the proper treatment of domestic uh, elephants no unfortunately not uh, i'm very sad to say this but unfortunately not because every question of elephants in captivity when it is brought about people start talking about the temples having elephants and no one in india will ever question a temple because they are very powerful institutions, they're very important institutions, and there are and it is a huge lobby. So it is very, very hard for a breakthrough in captive elephant conservation in our country simply because we are not able to tackle our temples or our religious community. In such a situation, if I go to a private elephant owner and say, 
you have to keep your elephants in such and such a way. And he turns around and asks me, why don't you go talk to the guys who have 48 elephants in a small patch of land under the hot sun and doing everything wrong and then come to me. And that is pretty much what is happening in our country. Hmm. That's a tough position. And there was a related question, but I think you addressed this is, um, can temple priests be educated by conservationists so they can change their practices? Yes, it is happening. It is happening, but unfortunately not successfully yet because it is a sense of pride for the temple and it also is a huge uh, source of income for the temple. And uh, I don't think, at least in my lifetime, they're going to give it up unless the government does some, something drastic. It is a huge vote bank. It is a huge uh, reservoir of money. It is a huge uh, powerhouse in our country. And in such a situation, it is very hard to influence them or, and everything goes in the name of tradition. And that is something which is very hard to break. Hmm. Are there any programs in schools to make uh, children more aware of uh, elephant conservation? Uh, in parts, in isolation, in different uh, schools, maybe because of some individual professors or some individual program, but nothing concrete, nothing solid in the long term basis. No. So kids, definitely most of the Indian kids. The first association with an elephant like me would be in a temple where they've gone and their parents would have said get a blessing and the elephant will come and tap my forehead with a with its trunk and that is probably probably the only association with the elephants which most people have in our country and seeing a wild elephant and seeing how majestic it looks in the wild maybe changes people but unfortunately, the whole idea of temple elephants is very deep rooted in our thought process right from a very early age. Um, I have a question here about the elephants who are on the island. Um, can female elephants uh, be darted with some sort of birth control medication or can elephants be sterilized to help control the population? Uh, yes, so we, they are trying that now. In, in fact, right now, uh, a, a couple of my researcher friends had gone there to find a solution. But what they realized was the jungle is so dense over there that it is very hard to get to the elephants. And these elephants are far more aggressive than wild elephants. They are feral elephants and they suddenly have this mentality where they're, they're, they're in this alien environment. And they come after anyone who goes there. And the only way to approach these elephants is on foot. So that is not working out too well. And like I told you, we don't have very highly trained vets in our wildlife department, unfortunately. So most of them, at least in the recent years, wherever they've tried to dart an elephant, they've got the dosage wrong, which has either led to human casualties or the elephant has died because of overdosing it. So no progress yet on the island situation. But yes, uh, tackling the females is one way to do it. But getting to them is a whole different problem, like I said, because of the how dense the forest is and how hard the visibility is and how ag aggressive the elephants are. Is WWF involved in trying to solve uh, the problems facing the domestic Asian elephant? Uh, well, WWF is working very heavily with wild elephants in some parts of the country where they're trying to safeguard the migratory routes of wild elephants, like in the Terai Arc landscape, the South Asian landscape, the South Indian, the Western Ghat landscape. So they are trying to make sure these corridors for the elephants remain intact. So WWF is definitely doing a lot on that front. But again, uh, they are doing some work with regards to captive elephants in other parts of South Asia, like Thailand and Nepal. But in India, like I said, the roadblock is the same for everyone, whether it may be WWF or the government or a conservationist or an individual like myself. The roadblock is religion which is not something which is very hard to, uh, which is not something which is going to be easy to circumvent. Uh, there are a lot of folks watching um, who want to know what they can do. So what, what is, what if anything can um, people in the international community do to help in regard to captive elephants? Well, I mean, I would definitely say at every chance that you get, discourage the practice. Do not contribute to any organization which supports such a practice. Uh, read up a lot about elephant venues that you visit in South Asia. Make sure that you're going to venues where it is not all commercial. There is a conservation aspect to it. Because part of it you have to realize, uh, unfortunately, these elephants are stuck in captivity. 
and the more income that that center earns the more uh, the elephants will be better taken care of so it is like a catch 22 situation but definitely by encouraging people with good practices and also questioning the need to do an elephant ride or questioning the need to go entertain oneself with an elephant if you ask the right questions before visiting a center and not just be taken in by the photographs and the entertainment quota then definitely that small bit will make a huge difference in changing maybe the thought process of the owners of the elephants who will realize that maybe if i do these things right or maybe if i do it like the other guys who are getting a lot of good quality people maybe i my center will also get such a good bunch of people who come in and situations like what we saw in the fort in jaipur situations like uh, elephants bathing in the sea for photographers and for tourists to take pictures a definite no no those are no brainers that it should be very easy for you to assess and say no to and when these people stop making money they will figure out alternatives and it is a constantly evolving thing that needs to go on at least for 20 to 30 years at least before this inhuman horrible practice is done with excellent thank you uh we are getting close to the top of the hour so i want to turn it back over to you Surya, for some closing comments okay well um um i'm just gonna see if i can turn on my video for this uh, um i just like to say to everyone thank you for listening in uh, this has been a topic which i'm very opinionated on like i told you because i've seen and i've not even put up a lot of my images here because they're a little too depressing i mean very depressing to be honest to see and i've never done an elephant safari in my life i've never been on an elephant ride um, except maybe when i was like eight years old when my parents took me on one but after i've seen all of this it has been a very simple choice on how you perceive a captive elephant how you perceive a wild elephant and how you respect any animal i mean it is very simple that in today's day and age when we are talking about handling pets like dogs and cats well people are still not talking about handling elephants well and that is the reality of elephant conservation through the world and even more in south asia because asian elephants have been easier to tame through history than the african counterparts so make a wise choice every time you travel advise your travel company or whoever it may be or it could even be your friend or your neighbor who's planning a holiday in south asia and wants to visit some elephant center spread the message make them aware and hopefully as a community of travelers or community of conscious travelers we can make a difference to these beautiful gentle giant giants who deserve a lot more than uh, what we have given them till now i hope absolutely that stays in all your heads thank you so thank much thank you so much surya this has certainly been eye opening for a lot of folks and it's such an important topic to bring to light so thank you so much for staying up late to present um, and my thanks to everyone who joined us today. Uh, be sure to join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. We did record today's presentation, so we'll have that replay available on our website soon. And with that, I will conclude the webinar. Thanks again, Surya. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you, Gandil. Good night.